Hi, I'm Sarah Barrup Neal, manager of the Glen Arbor Arts Center Exhibitions Program. Today is part of the Arts Center's current exhibit, Shrines and Altars. I'm in conversation with Josh Denby, head of the Sight and Sound Department at the Traverse City Area District Library, where there is an unexpected shrine. The Shrines and Altars exhibit explores what we hold sacred. To whom are we building shrines? And at what altars are we worshiping? Just so we have some common language here, um, a shrine is generally understood as a holy place. An altar is a table or a platform where offerings are presented. And both these things, the shrine and the altar, uh, offer space for memory, reverence, and reflection. So my friend Josh, you can see on the screen and behind him uh, at the Sight and Sound desk is a series of shelves filled with a thousand plus objects, little idols and icons, which in my mind make these shelves a de facto altar to popular culture and performing arts. So before we dig into this, Josh, welcome. And can you put the sight and sound altar into context? What's its origin story? So the origin story with this um, display or this shrine, um, we moved into this building about 25 years ago, actually 25 years ago this year. And this display actually started out because when we were transitioning away from laser discs to DVDs, a lot of our DVD purchases would come with these ephemera or extra sort of add-ons or collectibles. And so it actually started out, I have a little picture, which um, we can talk about. It started out very simple. It was sort of like some small cases or little pieces that came with those and then our patrons started to be to notice it and they started giving us stuff to add to this collection and then employees started bringing in things that they found or that were important to them but maybe didn't have a place in their home anymore and it just started it kept growing it grew and grew and grew um you mentioned that some of the objects came from as promotional swag um, some of the objects came from uh, colleagues and employees. Where else have objects come from? Oh, so many objects come from our patrons from all ages. And I think the interesting thing about getting items from patrons is that it really ties them into this display. Like people take... I wouldn't even call it ownership, but a sense of belonging or a sense of community because they brought something in and they love to come in and see the thing that they brought. Uh, we actually had someone, um, and I don't know if it's in frame, but they brought in a Clifford stuffed dog and then pointed out something that they had brought in, like I think 14 or 15 years ago, it was a Gumby. Uh -huh. And like, oh yeah, that's still there. That's my Gumby. And so I think it's a really great way to have people feel like the library belongs to them. Let me see if I can't share one of the pictures that I took here. So here we go. Oh, we yes. Tell us what's going on in this picture. So in this picture, we have, let's see, on the left-hand side, um, on the back, one of the things that jumps out to me is a CD of, of Late Night Tales, which is a series of CDs, and it's basically artists will c collect music that's meaningful to them, and then they'll maybe put, like, one or two originals, and then it's part of the series. So that's Bell and Sebastian, which are, and I believe they're Scottish group who started in the 90s. I see a Pee Wee Herman doll. 
on the right hand side, one that leaps out to me, and a lot of the ones that leap out to me are because I'm really interested in music, but it's a picture of Alice Coltrane, um, who is an amazing spiritual jazz artist. Uh, she played the harp. Oh gosh. And then I see sort of front and center, a little bit more recent, a, a Minions doll or a Minions <laughs> figure, which I'm pretty sure was given to us by one of our younger patrons. I think when they gave that to us, they were probably like eight or nine it seems like uh, so many then... it seems like so many of these objects run the gamut of music uh visual tv or movie um cultural objects like these little fuzzy guys in the front who look like they're been stuffed into a little coin pocket purse there doesn't seem to be it's, any particular it, the the shelf the altars just seem to evolve as it evolves is that a good observation is that an accurate observation oh yeah it it has been a really um i guess the way that i would think of it is sort of organic like there's there's not been any planning you know when we get stuff it's interesting when we get stuff we try to put something where it it feels right and so like that clifford that came in and the reason i said i don't know if it's in screen but it's perched on top of the head of a uh, gargoyle <laughs> almost like it's sort of overlooking the rest of the collection um, <laughs> but when one of my co-workers put it there we all just instantly were like that that's exactly where that needs to go it's a spiritual thing, the placement of these objects. Yeah. You know in your bones. Um, over time, the shelves have morphed from being purely functional, just to hold stuff, to becoming an altar. So if you could talk about how it has become more of an altar than just a set of functional wooden planks. And an altar to what do you think? Um, I th think that the transition from functional object to a really resonant space happened pretty quickly. And I think that it was something that people for a long time, like from very early on, people would stop and be drawn in by it, not as a thing for like, a you know, I need to ask a question about something. And that's what's so funny. People will come up to our our desk here. And I was like, oh, hey, can I help you? It's like, no, no, I'm just, I just want to look at this. And they'll find something that you can tell really draws them in. And then maybe they'll start a conversation about it. Or maybe it's just something that they want to experience in silence which i think is always really nice and i think that if i was to point out a, a thing that this is devoted to like popular culture or the idea of fiction and our relation to it in general it's something that i find super interesting is that Right now, we have a really interesting relationship with fiction and fictional entities in that we relate to them and they sort of invite us to fantasize and they invite us into a relationship with this fictional entity that's not purely fantasy, but it's also not reality. Mm -hmm. In an earlier conversation, you said some altars or shrines have an air of solemnity about them. It's something that invites silence or contemplation. This one is sort of a mix. You kind of refer to that when you talk about people standing and just wanting to focus on an object. Um, but can you elaborate a little bit about the solemnity aspect of it? Um, Solemnity might be something that people dismiss because of the objects that are there, some of which are 
um, very lighthearted. Um, I would propose, though, that Pee Wee Herman is an object that requires a lot of contemplation. I think that it's true. Um, there's definitely lighthearted and playful stuff. Sometimes when the pieces are arranged, we arrange them in such a way that there's such an odd juxtaposition that there's a sense of whimsy about it. But also, um, for me, and I think for a lot of patrons, if they see something that's really evocative, something that speaks really powerfully to them about an experience that they had, oftentimes in their childhood, like so much of the stuff that we have for me personally is really evocative of my childhood. And it can take you back maybe even beyond the fantasy element that I was talking about earlier, but takes you back to an earlier time in your life. And reflecting on that time in your life is, it can be really wonderful, but it's also something that's happening sort of maybe on many levels, but often deep inside something that, you know, a memory comes up and it's so powerful that it's, it's hard to share it vocally. You just, think about it. Mm -hmm. I know so, when, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I go ahead. I know when I look at the sight and sound altar, I have a very visceral response, kind of, I want to jump over the desk and start getting my hands on some of the objects. Um, I think that a visceral response is what we hope our idols and icons and objects of reverence inspire in us. I, I would agree with that. I think that one of the cool things about this and sort of about icons and shrines in general is it's, it's not usually an intellectual response. Like it's not a, it's not from a stance of removal. It's like, sort of like you said, you want to get close to it and you want to interact with it and you want, it's not something where you consider like, oh yes, I, I do believe I should approach and like start picking things up in a logical way. Mm -hmm. Something just draws you in without that sort of internal reasoning, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, in the realm of logic, uh, you've never counted or catalog the objects in the altar. So talk about the thinking behind that. Um, I really think that to catalog something or to measure it is to constrain it or to really, like cataloging something makes it less than the sum of its parts in a way that I don't think any shrine or altar would invite um because it's definitely possible to do it it's definitely possible to take any sort of you know sacred space and say ah you know this shrine consists of you know four shelves of objects and each shelf is 12 inches deep and eight feet long there's a space of 18 inches between each shelf and the more and more you do that the less and less of that aura or magic that it has. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we don't need to be cataloging our um, spiritual feelings, I don't think. Which is what's so funny is that we're in a library where everything else <laughs> is intensely cataloged and detailed and recorded. So this is sort of an interesting space within a space. That's a very good observation because keeping track of things is part of the mission of a library. Uh, the sight and sound department is open daily during uh, library hours. So anytime the library is open, one may visit the altar. And Josh is there and Keith, his colleague is there and any other number of people are there who can um, help be a docent. The 
Glen Arbor Arts Center Shrines and Altars exhibit runs through October 24. And to learn more about that, go to glenarborart.org and click on the exhibits tab for more information about the exhibit and the programs. Um, Josh, I can't thank you enough. Um, this has just been a lovely conversation, and I was so glad that you were game for it. Oh, Sarah, it's been my pleasure. This was wonderful. And thanks to all of you for listening, and see you next time. <laughs>